Thank you so much. Thanks for including me in the program. Uh, and I was given the task to talk about uh, how the treatment of spinal tumors really have evolved uh, within the last uh, uh, several decades. And uh, this is a big topic, as you can imagine, to cover. Um, so uh, a lot of things happen in cancer care. I think uh, it's important to uh, put that into a framework uh, uh, when we are looking at how the treatment has evolved over many decades. And just to give you one example, I cannot cover many of them at the moment, given the time restriction here. But this is a patient with metastatic melanoma. Uh, you can see how uh, uh, the patient who um, uh, uh, has a white strip spread metastases on the left side uh, was found to have a specific mutation in the BRAF gene. And if you were to use a drug that's targeting that gene, you can see how uh, the patient's diffused metastases can be treated very effectively. Now, many of these patients are living for, uh, for a number of years after uh, diagnosis. Uh, with spinal metastases, and uh, many of these patients they used to die very quickly uh, after initial diagnosis. Just showing you uh, molecular profiling of these tumors, some of the under understandings of the genomics really uh, ha uh, have changed the way that we approach these tumors. It's important to see uh, how the treatment really has evolved over the last 30 years. Uh, this is uh, 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 looking at the outcome in patients with metastatic spinal uh, tumors with epidural spinal cord compression and the use of uh, conventional radiation therapy in treating these tumors. And you can see here, uh, perhaps only a quarter of patients uh, with uh, uh, tumors uh, that are treated with um, conventional radiation therapy uh, were found to have improved neurologically uh, when you use conventional radiation therapy as the primary mode of treatment. Uh, later, the, the surgeons thought that perhaps they were to use a laminectomy operation to improve the outcomes uh, in these patients they could make a difference, but you can see the results again uh, from a large, uh, uh, you know, series of cases uh, and the papers uh, from the literature. Uh, the results were essentially identical, uh, and so the laminectomy really did not add anything uh, to the treatment of patients with metastatic epidural spinal cord compression over uh, conventional radiation therapy alone. There was only one small prospective randomized trial which demonstrated absolutely no difference. So many of the medical oncologists and radiation oncologists became con convinced that. Uh, there was really no role for surgery, uh, but in this case, the surgery being a laminectomy operation, as you can imagine, the laminectomy is not the best way to the compression spinal cord when you have metastatic disease that is most of the time located in the vertebral body compressing the cord. I would say that the surgeons later rised up and realized that perhaps uh, if the laminectomy is not the best way to the compression spinal cord, uh, furthermore, we are de 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 destabilizing the spine, doing something from posterior, but more extensive. It should be a better the compression, uh, but at the same time, also stabilizing the spine can potentially make a difference. And you can see these papers uh, uh, showing that indeed the neurological outcome was now significantly better. better. Over 60% of the patients uh, were found to have improved after the surgical intervention. Not only that, but also we have seen that uh, the pain uh, that these patients reported uh, also have gotten better uh, after, uh, after this kind of approach, including uh, stabilization. And then finally, I would say that the, uh, the uh, surgeons have gotten more comfortable with the anterior portions of the spinal column in patients with metastatic disease. And you can see our, our series and many others from the literature uh, really have demonstrated that uh, these patients uh, can do uh, quite well. Uh, neurological improvement was even better with the anterior approach than the compression stabilization. And in addition to that, the pain, again, was improved in the vast majority of the patients. So if you look at this 30 years of experience in terms of what really uh, really has happened, I think we can draw a number of conclusions. We have, uh, we can say that the laminectomy is not the best operation that you should be doing in patients with metastatic spinal tumors. Uh, number two, I think we learned that the spinal stabilization is an integral part of any surgical intervention in patients with metastatic disease. Um, and uh, and uh, many of the, in many of the cases, the underlying pain in patients with metastatic disease is really due to spinal instability, hence is best addressed with spinal stabilization. And the third, I would say that the better the, the compression of the spinal cord, the more direct the approach to it is, uh, the better the neurological outcome is. Of course, none of this really uh, a level one evidence or prospective randomized trial showing the benefit of the surgical treatment of over conventional radiation therapy. And hence, uh, we, uh, this brings us to this paper uh, that was published now almost 15 years ago by Roy Patchell, um, uh, comparing uh, the patients who received 
uh, conventional radiation therapy versus those who had surgical decompression stabilization coupled with uh, conventional radiation therapy. In this trial, all the what we call radiation sensitive tumors, namely lymphomas, multiple myeloma, small cell C of the lung, and so forth, have been excluded. So we are looking only at uh, a solid tumor. Then you can see very significant difference uh, between the ambulatory rates uh, uh, the pa for the patients who had. Uh, the compression stabilization followed by radiation therapy com compared to radiation therapy alone, uh, clearly demonstrating that the surgery had very significant benefit in improving uh, the outcome in these patients. But you have to recognize that the radiation therapy that has been used in this setting really has been uh, conventional radiation therapy. And we do also know that certain tumors such as renal cell carcinoma is not terribly sensitive to uh, conventional radiation therapy. And then later, uh, uh, serotactic radio surgery, focused radiation therapy came into play. And we knew that from the brain, uh, metastatic brain tumor, that it's a highly effective treatment. And you can again see that in the spine, we have seen the same kind of uh, effect where uh, the epidural disease was very effectively controlled and the pain was uh, very effectively addressed in the majority of the patients. Uh, so serotactic radio surgery definitely has uh, changed the uh, field of metastatic uh, spine uh, tumor treatment uh, and the surgical approaches uh, to the uh, spine tumors. Uh, however, we also learned that um, uh, the uh, serotactic radio surgery is not a, really a panacea. It doesn't really solve all of our problems. Uh, here's a paper from MD Anderson Cancer Center uh, looking at patients with metastatic renal cell carcinoma, only 55 patients that you could see here. Uh, you can see that 12 of those patients, all of them were treated with serotactic radio surgery. 12 of them had recurrence, and then they required uh, open surgical procedures at a later time. And when they, you look at these patients more critically, you realize that, that the reason this really happened is because the tumor really was making contact with the spinal cord, in, uh, filling up the epidural space. And uh, that led to a diminished amount of uh, uh, dose of radiation to uh, the target right next to the spinal cord. Uh, and typically the patients uh, got their recurrences in that area and hence uh, failed the uh, serotactic radio surgery. And this brings up uh, another concept now, I think that um, uh, uh, will be discussed later in the talks, is that uh, if the serotactic radio surgery is not successful, if the tumor is making contact with the spinal cord, is there a way that one can create some space around the spinal cord and use the serotactic radio surgery effectively? And this paper from Sloan Kettering, uh, Dr. Ida Laufer and Mark Bilski's group uh, reported that uh, you can really do what's called a separation surgery, separate the tumor from the spinal cord and create a safe zone. And so then you can go ahead and give high dose of radiation treatment, serotactic radio surgery to the target, and you can really very effectively uh, control the treatment. And you can say, again, they also noted that uh, the single dose of radiation and at least 24 grades of radiation uh, was a better option than other modes of treatment. A very low uh, failure rate here showing only 4.1% 4, 4 uh, failure. So uh, separation surgery in the cases where the tumor is making contact with the spinal cord appears to be a reasonable strategy in achieving the objective. Here's an example of a patient with metastatic tumor uh, showing severe spinal cord uh, cardiac compression on the left side. And you can see on the right side after the separation surgery, a safe zone was uh, recreated around the spinal cord and hence the radiation radio surgery can be very effectively uh, delivered here. Um, and so uh, in the current uh, uh, decision-making paradigm, and when you look at the patient with metastatic disease, we typically use what's called the NOMS uh, classification system, look, uh, assessing the patient's neurological status, mainly if they have myelopathy or not, uh, oncological status, meaning the primary tumor type, which uh, tumor type is cellologically that is usually the primary driver of the uh, patient's survival and many other things. And the mechanical stability of the spine is a very important uh, element. Uh, the spinal instability neoplastic scale that was introduced by spinal oncology study group is used uh, to further assess the stability of the spine in the setting of metastatic disease. And finally, whether or not the patient, uh, the, the, semi, the status of the systemic disease, whether or not the patient medically fit to have the surgery uh, plays a role in decision-making. But uh, uh, more recently, we started also introducing the genotyping of the tumor or molecular profiling of the uh, primary tumor uh, as a factor in determining uh, overall survival of the patient, which seems to be uh, changing the field uh, significantly. Um, let me move on to the, uh, just a few words about the uh, primary spine tumors. This is a, a sort of a whole list of uh, primary spinal column tumors that we see and uh, not a complete list by any means, but you can, I'm gonna draw your attention these uh, tumors that are highlighted here with 
uh, capital letters, namely the Cordomas and Condorcet Cormas, because of the uh, time restriction, you know, I'll, I'll take Cordoma as an example to show how we should really be approaching these tumors. Uh, these two tumors are really regarded uh, as primarily surgical entities, meaning that uh, the best treatment for these uh, two tumor types, particularly low-grade versions of those, are really uh, a complete resection of the tumor with uh, negative margins. Um, this has been debated for a long time. Uh, uh, this is one of the definitive papers that we published uh, a, a, a number of years ago now, uh, looking uh, using the uh, Aon uh, uh, Spine Tumor Knowledge Forum database and ex extracted, you can see about 14, 1,500 patients from the database. And we identified over 350 patients with uh, chordomas and specifically looked at whether or not uh, resecting the tumor in an embolic fashion can make a difference in the overall survival of these patients, as well as uh, time to fall, uh, first recurrence. And you can see the uh, distinct separation of the survival curves between those patients who so-called enacting appropriate procedure, which means that the tumor has been resected completely with negative margins, uh, you can see those patients definitely live longer. And the same is true when you look at time to first local recurrence, uh, the patients who had enacting appropriate procedure uh, had a much uh, longer time period until they got uh, their first occurrences. So I think this kind of data really, and many others now in the literature clearly uh, indicated that the best way to treat patients with chordomas, chondrosarcomas, these types of uh, primary uh, spinal column tumors are uh, really uh, unblocked resection of the tumor with negative margins. And so I think that, you know, this is sort of the take home message from this when we are dealing with metastatic tumors, uh, typically, our goal is to effectively palliate the patient, get rid of their pain, and preserve neurological status. And the surgical technique that we employ in this setting is really intralesional resection of the tumor and stabilization. Whereas, if we are dealing with primary tumors such as chordoma or chondrosarcoma, our goal really uh, is really to try to cure the patient if possible. And uh, the surgical technique typically we use here uh, would be an end block resection of the tumor. And I'll highlight this with two case examples. Um, I know I'm running out of time here. Uh, but here's an example of a patient with metastatic lung cancer. This patient had a T3 metastasis of a significant spinal cord compression and presented with intractable inter interscapular mechanical uh, back pain. She's 76 years old. The, the underlying lung cancer could not be resected. The patient received short course of chemotherapy, couldn't tolerate that very well, but she's disabled and she's not able to walk when she came into the hospital and she's not in medically very good shape. And as you can see here, we approach this uh, using uh, minimal invasive techniques with the uh, uh, tubular retractors on both sides uh, using Vilsi approach to gain access to the area of interest. And the spinal cord can uh, be effectively decompressed here, as you can see. You can see the tied nerve roots there, and you can see the anterior column reconstruction here after the tumor resection with a cage that was filled with uh, bone graft. And then subsequently, the patient uh, received that cranial screw uh, placement, as you can see here, for additional stabilization posteriorly. And this is the patient's back showing the stab wounds related to um, the pedicle screws, as well as and linear incisions on either side related to the Wilsey approach and uh, the compression of the spinal cord. In this uh, medically fragile patient, all the objectives really have, have been achieved here. The, uh, the patient's stability issue had been addressed with cage reconstruction and screw stabilization. We avoided wound complications without, uh, uh, since we did not do any wide uh, muscle di dissection. And the patient was discharged from the hospital three days later, really walking uh, with a cane as well as um, a complete relief of her pain. And so uh, this kind of strategy really has really worked very nicely in this patient. Here's another example where this is a patient with a primary spinal column tumor where we couldn't see that there's a large chordoma involving uh, primarily the L4 vertebra, but that's definitely extending to the levels above envelope. As I indicated, our goal here is really to this, uh, resect this tumor in a complete manner. And for this, the, the two-stage operation, first from posteriorly with a wide dissection, long stabilization, uh, to stabilize the lumbosacral junction. Uh, we have a number of other things that we put in here. You can see that we, uh, we place a tomato sauce here to be able to cut the spine from anteriorly when we come from there. And then we have other wires that are encircling the construct posteriorly to stabilize the cage after the cage is placed from an anterior approach at a later time. And you can see the patient's back uh, during the first stage of the operation. The patient's head is on the left side and the feet are on the right side wide dissection of the catequina here. All the nerves have been followed into the retroperitoneal space, long instrumentation that goes all the way down to the pelvis. And then, and then the second stage of the operation is done through a midline laparotomy approach. And you can see um, the space that we created between the great vessels. And then now we retrieve the tomato saw that we have placed from posteriorly to be able to transect the spinal column um, very precisely. And you can see 
uh, hypothetically, that's what's going to happen. When we cut the spine out, we should be able to really remove the tumor in an unblocked fashion. And the interior column can then be reconstructed uh, with a distractible cage that fits perfectly into that shape um, and then secured in place with some wires that are encircled uh, through the construct in the back. And here's a patient specimen that has been removed in one uh, piece containing three vertebral bodies. And you can see the anterior lock onto this area for the reconstruction of this region uh, with a cage that had been uh, placed in the defect there uh, on the bottom on the right side, you see the end plate of S1. Um, and, and, um, and then subsequently how the x-ray looks in terms of reconstruction this area uh, and how the construct is really put together. You can see we have four rods in the back since uh, this area may not fuse and we should really be prepared to make sure that we, we, we have adequate uh, stabilization of this area to avoid any type of <clears throat> construct uh, failure. And here's the story, and I'll see how it compares to the MRI. Uh, the last slide We have here, to wrap uh, up soon. Yeah. yeah, this is the last slide here. As you can see, um, you know, it's important to understand the biology of these tumors uh, in terms of defining the goal of the treatment. I hope I, am, I was able to make the uh, point that m block resection of primary tumors uh, uh, leads to improved survival. Um, and then finally, recent approach, uh, advanced in surgical approaches, techniques, as well as instrumentation now allow us to remove these tumors more completely with negative margins. Uh, and with that, thank you so much uh, for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts.